right, we'll start again in Genesis chapter 1. We just began a series last week on the Genesis gap. And uh, in the introductory lesson, we saw the real issue uh, concerning the gap between the first two verses of Genesis is not geology. A lot of people try to make that the issue, uh, the time involved. That time is pointless. This is before time as we know it. This is an eternity past. The issue is not about that. It's about the mystery of the body of Christ. This is definitely connected. And this is what we're going to develop as we go along in this series. I just kind of mentioned that, but we want to elaborate more on that later. The connection between the Genesis gap and the mystery of the body of Christ. And uh, as we're going to see this morning, it's also the most logical place, in my opinion, uh, to put the fall of Lucifer, to reject the idea of the gap between the first two verses uh, makes it very challenging concerning the fall of Lucifer. It fits perfectly here. And so that's that really the issue of when Lucifer fell becomes a major part of this discussion. So Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice heaven, not heavens. Okay, the King James Bible is the only English Bible that gets this right. <laughs> All the modern versions say heavens. There's heavens in Genesis 2.1. God makes three heavens in the six days. But in the original creation, it says heaven and earth. Now, why is there three heavens? We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. It's for the purpose of division. Why would there need to be a division? We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. So originally... At some point in eternity past, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Full stop. Now, we're going to see as we go along that verse 2, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, which is a key in understanding the Word of God, the words in verse 2 are words of judgment, not creation. The earth was without form and void and darkness. I mean, though, I mean, stop right there and think a little bit. Now, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So how does darkness come about? When God withdraws his presence, there's darkness. God is light. So why is there darkness here? <laughs> there's, a, there's an issue. There's there's. There is something going on that it's just, it's implied in the verse, but it's not explained until you look at other verses, okay? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was flooded out. Why did God flood out the world in Noah's day? And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, when Adam sinned, he was the head of the human race, the first man. He had dominion on the earth. When he sinned, it brought a great judgment. God cursed the whole earth. Uh, by the way, Adam was not the first sinner. There are people who say, well, sin comes with Adam. Well, they, they base that on Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world. And death by sin, so death, death passed upon who? All men. Wherefore is by one man sin in the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What world is it talking about? You know there's different worlds in the Bible, don't you? Didn't Hebrews 1 say Christ made the worlds? Do you think world means planet? It could be used in reference to the, to the, the, the earth, but it has a lot more going in that word when you study how it's used in the Bible concerning ages and governments. And so you have the scripture refers to the world that then was, 2 Peter 3. It refers to the world to come, Hebrews 2.5. Uh, this present evil world in Galatians 1. There are different worlds. When Adam sinned, he brought sin and death into the world of mankind. Look, Lucifer sinned before Adam. You have to acknowledge that. Not only did Lucifer sin before Adam, a third of innumerable angels. How many is a third of innumerable? <laughs> That's a lot. 
A third of the angels follow Lucifer in his rebellion. They sinned before Adam, and the woman even sinned before Adam, right? She was deceived, she disobeyed, and then she tempted the man. Satan used, tempted the woman and then used her to tempt the man. The woman fell before Adam. How come sin and death didn't come through the woman? Because she's not the head of the human race. It came through the man. All right, so you can't say, and we'll, talk, we'll elaborate more on that later in another lesson, but they, people say Romans 5.12 uh, refutes the gap. It certainly does not when you understand what the verse is in its context. There was obviously sin before Adam. Now, we'll have more to say about that later, but the, you know, when you look at the judgment that came through the fall of Adam, doesn't it make sense there would have been a cataclysmic judgment that fell on Lucifer and the angels that followed him? Well, the only verse in the Old Testament that fits such a judgment is Genesis 1-2. It fits perfectly right there. And when you compare scriptures and see that everything it says in verse 2 has to do with judgment and evil in the Bible, using biblical terminology now, allowing the scripture to interpret itself, God doesn't create the earth without form and void uh, in darkness under a great deep of water. It got that way through, it makes perfect sense to me, you don't have to agree like I've said, but you got to put the fall of Lucifer somewhere and it fits perfectly right here. So the first two verses of Genesis are a brief preface. You have to understand the scope of this passage and the purpose um, the focus in Genesis 1 is not on Lucifer and the angels and all that. The focus is on mankind. It's on the heavens and the earth as God made it for mankind. Everything God made in the six days in Genesis 1 was very good. Look at Genesis 1 verse 31. Here's another verse that people say, well, this refutes the gap, and it certainly doesn't. Genesis 1, 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, to me, it's, it's clear, it's obvious that that verse, that statement that everything he made is limited in the, by the context to what he's doing in these six days. But I remind you, Genesis 1, and, verses 1 and 2, is before the six days. The six days have bookends. It always starts with, and God said, and it ends the evening and the morning with the first day, the evening and the morning with the second day, and so on. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 is a preface. It is before the six days. When he saw everything was very good, he's talking about what he had done during those six days. And, and, and look, there are clear implications that something is wrong when God creates man. Now, I'll just give you seven points. I could give you more, but we'll go with this, and I'll try to be brief with this. Evil existed before the fall of man. No doubt about it. Number one, in the scripture, the terms without form, void, darkness, and deep are all associated with evil in God's judgment. And we'll, we'll elaborate on that later, but I'm just saying that's very important, obviously, to see. Number two, the darkness and heaven are not called good. Now, you notice in Genesis 1, as you read through there, uh, for example, I mean, if you go through the six days, how many times does God say, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, right? I mean, it's, it's, he's emphasizing what he was doing was good. It was good. And then he sums it up and says it's very good. Now, look in Genesis 1, verse 3. God said, let there be light. You say, well, the sun doesn't... Uh, Come until the fourth day. We'll talk about that later. But here's the thing. God is light. This light radiates from himself. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it, the light, was good. And God divided. Now, that's a, that's a key word there. Uh, in understanding what's going on in these six days, God's making some divisions. God divided the light from the darkness. Now you trace all through the Bible the conflict between light and darkness. Light is associated with God and darkness is associated with who? Satan. He, he, is, he has the power of darkness. I think about whenever the Lord saved Saul of Tarsus and uh, 
commissioned him, as, as Paul recounts that, I'm just going to read this to you real quick in Acts 26, 18, when he's sent in his ministry, it says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. That tells you that the darkness is associated with the power of Satan, the light with the power of God. And you have this conflict throughout the Bible. He divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Did God say that darkness was good? No, he didn't. He specifies all through here things that are good. He didn't say anything about darkness being good. Look at verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. There is a great deep of water between the second and third heaven. This is not talking about a canopy over the earth that you know, fell in the flood of Noah and all this. This is talking, it's still up there. <laughs> there is a great deep of water between the second and third heaven. Many verses, we'll talk, we'll, again, we'll elaborate on a lot of this later. I'm just briefly mentioning these things now as we get started. The heaven between the waters on the earth and above the earth, the second heaven the first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is what we refer to as space. The third heaven is where God's throne is. But that heaven is not called good. Did you notice that? And why would that be? Because the heavens are not clean in the sight. Job 15, 15. Why is that? Because there's spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 12. And Satan is the prince and power of the air. And he and his fallen angels have a place in the second heaven, according to Revelation 12, and other verses we can look at. Why would God make three heavens? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens, singular. Genesis 2.1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. There's three heavens. And there's a great deep, and, and by the way, when God, the, the, the seas on the earth are for division. Which, did you know in the new earth there's not going to be any more sea? There won't need to be any division in the new earth because there's no more sin. So you have no more sea between the second and third heaven and no more sea on the earth. There was no sea on the original earth. Because whenever God made marine life, he created them for the first time and told them to fill the waters. He didn't tell them to replenish it because they were there for the first time. But he told Adam to replenish the earth because there were sons of God on the earth before Adam. Adam is a son of God, direct creation of God. Angels are sons of God, direct creation of God. So you have the three heavens issue. If you understand that issue, you understand it's for division. Why division? There's something wrong. Number three, man was created in response to the enemy. Look in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, about the creation of man. i got to get going, man. I'm never going to get all this in this morning. Psalm 8, verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So dealing with God giving man dominion on the earth and God creating man, you have this issue of that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And there, and there are, there's reasons to believe that Adam was created in response to the enemy. Okay, now, Adam is told in Genesis 1, verse 28, to subdue the earth. Isn't that, isn't that strange language if there's nothing wrong? What does he have to subdue it? This is before the fall. When God created man, he told him, subdue the earth. 
Now, what does it mean to subdue something? Well, the next reference in the Word of God is 1 Chronicles 17 and verse number 10. And that says, uh, let me get there. I'm in the wrong place here. 1 Chronicles 17, 10. That's the next reference to subdue, and it defines it for you. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee in house, talking to David now. I will subdue all thy enemies. Subdue means to conquer enemies. Why would God tell Adam to subdue the earth if there are no enemies? Secondly, along, not only did he tell him to subdue the earth, what did he tell him to do? To keep the garden. That's before the fall. <laughs> what does he have to keep the garden for? In the idea is there to protect it. He told him to keep the garden. That language there is implying there, there's enemies. Genesis 2.9 God said that he put there in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, there must be evil. <laughs> How do you have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil if there's no evil that's in existence? Evil existed before Adam fell. Sin did not originate with Adam. It originated with Lucifer. All right. Genesis 3.6. Satan tempting the woman. God doth know that the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There's good and evil. Who are the gods? Lowercase g. We're going to see a little bit later, that's referring to angels, the mighty ones. There's fallen angels when Satan says that. And by the way, notice the woman doesn't say, who are you talking about? They were aware there was an enemy. You see, the, mount, the, the evidence mounts as you go along that there's something, something, everything is not perfect. Even in this early context here, there's implications of things being wrong because, again, sin did not originate with Adam. It originated with Lucifer. Now, the first time Satan shows up, and his name, Satan, means adversary. The first time he shows up in the scripture, he's already a fallen creature. Genesis 3.1 says, The serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now we know who that serpent is. Revelation 12.9, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. This is Satan here in Genesis 3.1. He's already a fallen creature. His fall is implied but not recorded in Genesis. Those who think that if the fall of Lucifer took place before the six days of Genesis 1, that God would have said so. And I've, heard, I've heard it said that way. Well, if there was a fall of Lucifer before the six days, God would have said so right there in the passage. That... When people say things like that, honestly, it makes me think they're inexperienced in Bible study. Because that's not how it is in the Word of God. Look, and, and not only are they inexperienced in Bible study, they're inconsistent. They're inconsistent because they have to put the, the fall of Lucifer in a gap somewhere in Genesis chapter 2. They don't want to put it before Genesis 1.31 because they think Genesis 1.31 means there was nothing bad going on. Even though that's not what the point of the verse is. But they have to put it before Genesis 3.1 because here comes a fallen creature. So what, so what you, if you have to put a gap in Genesis 2 if you reject the gap between the first two verses. So everybody has a gap theory, my friend. Right? You have to put it in there because it's not stated. Does everybody follow that? That's crucial to this argument. Well, you, you believe in a gap theory. You're just reading it in there. It's not there. You have to put, the, regardless, if you reject the gap between the first two verses, you are putting a gap somewhere because Lucifer fell somewhere. And it's to me just to think that God created Lucifer and all the angels in the six days with, without saying a word about it in the six days. 
and then immediately Satan falls and immediately tempts the man. And then, I mean, it's just so rapid. And then before that, there was nothing. God was just sitting there waiting to create stuff. The infinite, eternal God did nothing until 6,000 years ago. You can believe that if you want. I mean, that's your prerogative. So, uh, God wrote the book, and we finished last time talking about this. He wrote the book in such a way we must search the scriptures to gain understanding. Because the Bible's not laid out in a systematic order like a theological textbook, okay? You're going to have to compare scripture with scripture and search the scriptures. One of the principles of Bible study is what we call the principle of subsequent mention, okay? So God may withhold information in a passage that he's going to provide later, as he progressively reveals things according to how he wants to reveal it. For, for example, this is just a little example, but it's, there's many things like this in the Bible. We don't learn the names of Pharaoh's ma magicians. In Exodus 7, 11, the, uh, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Who, what are the names of the magicians? You don't know until the last book of the Bible written, 2 Timothy, and that's another study for another time, but I do believe it's the last book that was written chronologically. 2 Timothy 3, 8, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. Why did God wait so long to tell us their names? Well, he, he, he can do whatever he wants. It's his book. <laughs> but you can't argue with the fact that the names aren't given for those magicians until much later. Did you know that when Israel crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground, they were baptized unto Moses? You, you didn't know that until Paul told you. 1 Corinthians 10. See? There's things like that all through the Bible. So God has very good reasons for skipping over certain things and giving more information about it later. So don't tell God how to write his book. Amen. I, mean, if you, I mean, look, if man would have wrote it, you really think we would have said, he made the stars also. That's all he says about the stars. Fascinating subject, right? It's not twinkle, twinkle, little star either, by the way. Fascinating subject, and God said, hey, he made the stars also. And then he gives you all these details about Abraham and his seed, you know, and how he lied about his wife. And you're like, what? I want more information on the stars. But God is writing the book the way he is for good reasons, and it's his book. Now, if you would, go please to um, get Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. We're going to look at both of those. And obviously, in a lesson like this, we can only hit the highlights on these passages. There is a connection in the Word of God between history and prophecy. You have to get that. Understanding the past is key to understanding the future. Understanding the future is key in understanding the past. The wise man said in Ecclesiastes 1.9, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. And so human history is not linear, it is rather circular because when you study the Bible comparing Genesis and Revelation, it all comes around full circle, okay? There's a correspondence between how the Bible opens and how it closes. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why does there need to be a new heaven and a new earth? And, and, and I've showed you before, we've looked at this in other studies, but there are many things like that comparing Genesis and Revelation to show the circumference of time so that everything comes back around full circle. In the world to come, Hebrews 2, 5 and other references, the world to come, there will be a, a rebellion of Satan when he's loosed out of the bottomless pit, resulting in a cataclysmic judgment when God burns up the heavens and earth in order to make a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 20 and 21. That's going to happen in the world to come. You know what that mirrors? It mirrors what took place in the world that then was. <laughs> 2 Peter 3, the world that then was is not talking about before the flood of Noah. Now, I know most people say that, but we've taught on this before, and we're going to get to it later, but that passage... There are many things in it that tell you this is looking beyond Noah's flood, okay? Uh, the heavens weren't destroyed in Noah's flood. 
and a lot of other things we can point out about that passage. But there was a world that then was. There is a world to come. And when you lay out the, the timeline of Scripture, it is in a circle, and if you leave out the gap, you have an incomplete outline. Because everything in the end corresponds with the beginning. Do you understand? If, if there's going to be a rebellion of Satan, cataclysmic judgment, new heavens and earth, you know what that corresponds with? There was a rebellion of Satan, cataclysmic judgment, and God recreated everything in six days. Everything comes back around full circle. Now, when we learn about the historical fall of Satan, how do we learn about it? Where do we go to learn about the history of when Lucifer fell, we go to prophecy. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? All right, Isaiah 14. We read about God's judgment on the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 is the Antichrist. But beyond that, it's, it's Satan who's going to fill the Antichrist. Okay? We know Babylon is going to be rebuilt and that Satan is going to reign from there in the future 70th week of Daniel. We've been studying that in the book of Revelation. So when he's talking to the king, of, look, if you think Isaiah 14 is about his Nebuchadnezzar or something, then <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's obvious it's talking about the fall of Lucifer, okay? And, and Satan, it, and, and there's prophecy here. There's prophecy about the Antichrist, but you see the Antichrist is going to be filled with Satan. That's why, that's why it's history and prophecy, because you understand prophecy by history, and you understand history by prophecy. Isaiah 14, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high, yet, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, and so on. I'd like to read more, but for time, we're just going to read those verses there. Now, look, there is history and prophecy here, okay? Now, by the way, this is the, the only mention of Lucifer in the Bible. If you got a modern version, you don't have it. I wonder who would want to take that out. I don't know, maybe Lucifer. Understanding who he was originally, Lucifer means light bearer. Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He said, was he talking about the future or the past? Both. Because there is a fall of Satan in the past and the future. And they correspond. Uh, Paul said that Satan can appear as an angel of light. Now, I don't believe technically Satan was an angel. Some say he was an archangel. He was a, he was a cherub. He was a cherub. He's never called an angel. He can appear as an angel of light, make an appearance as a, as a, as a light-bearing creature. But Lucifer here is omitted in the modern versions. Not only that, to add insult to injury, in the NIV, uh, which stands for the non-inspired version, it says in Isaiah 14, 12, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, and then in Revelation twenty two sixteen 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to give you this testimony for the church as I am the root, offspring of David, the bright and morning star. What does NIV and other versions do the same thing? What, the modern versions that are corrupt are calling Lucifer and Jesus by the same name. That's blasphemy. That right there is enough to make you reject the modern versions. That one thing. There are many, many other examples of corruption in the modern versions. That proves Satan is behind the corrupt modern versions because it's his ambition to be Jesus Christ. He was the anointed cherub. Anointed means Christ. He's a false Christ, though. He wants to be Jesus Christ. He's the one who wants to take that name. Now, notice in Isaiah 14, Lucifer in pride said, I will, five times, five is the number of death in the Bible, five times, I will ascend into heaven. Well, then Lucifer must have been on the earth when he said this in his heart. He had great authority. It had something to do with the earth originally. Secondly, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars there, I believe, are probably talk, talking about the angels. Angels are called stars in the Bible. He wants to rule over the angels. Thirdly, I'll sit upon the mount of the congregation the sides of the north. 
That's where the angels convene to give an account of their activities. You ever read over there in Job chapters 1 and 2 when the angels present themselves before God and Satan was among them and they're giving an account of, of their activities? That's an interesting thing. At Job 1, 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Sons of God there is talking about the angels. In Psalm 82, 1, it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty... He judgeth among the gods. This congregation on the sides of the north, there's a meeting place here, and that's talking about angels. By the way, at the end of Psalm 82, it said, I've said, you are gods and all of you, the children of the Most High, but you shall die like men. So obviously these gods are not men. You shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations in the day of, God, in the, day of the Lord when he casts out these fallen angels. But you have the, the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. And um, he said, I'll send above the heights of the clouds. Now, again, I think the clouds here is more likely to do with God's presence and his glory. And you read about clouds in the scriptures. Not always talking about the literal clouds in the sky, but the clouds associated with his presence and glory. But here, here sums it up. This is his great ambition. I'll be like the most high. Well, this statement reveals his ambition to be the possessor of heaven and earth because the first mention of Most High in Genesis 14, verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And that's Satan's goal. He said, I'll be like the Most High. He wants to possess heaven and earth. Well, by the way, the scripture reveals a five-fold casting down of Satan. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18, Luke 14, 11, if you exalt yourself, you'll be abased. So you have, first of all, he was cast down in his original rebellion. Secondly, he'll be cast out of heaven in the middle of the 70th week, Revelation 12. He'll not only be cast out of heaven, he'll be cast to the earth, Revelation 12. He will then be cast in the bottomless pit in Revelation 20, and then finally he'll be cast in the lake of fire in Revelation 20.10. Uh, he just gets lower and lower. <laughs> Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. Begin reading in verse number 11 here. So in Ezekiel 28, we see something similar like we saw in Isaiah 14. It's about God's judgment on the king of Tyrus, but it certainly looks ahead to the Antichrist and Satan. And if you compare Ezekiel 27 with Revelation 18, you're going to see how the ancient Tyrus pictures the future Babylon. Um, by the way, if you have any trouble with... You say, well, if he meant Satan, why does he call him the king of Babylon or the king of Tyrus? I don't know. Why did he tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan? Right? And now what he told Peter, he was speaking to Satan through Peter. He was influencing Peter's thinking, Matthew 16. So the, the, the reality is he is definitely addressing the, the, the passages or prophecy about the Antichrist, but, they're, but understanding what's going to happen in the future regarding the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to be filled with Satan, so it's brought up what happened in the original fall of Satan in the past, all right? So uh, in Ezekiel 28, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and send to him, Thus saith the Lord, God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's not being said of a mere man. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Notice he didn't say you were in the garden of Eden. Is there not a difference between God planting a garden eastward in Eden? Eden's a country. There's a difference between that and Eden itself being the garden of God. I'll show you this. Hang on. Thou hast been in Eden the garden of God. Ever precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. So obviously this is not talking about a man. This is Satan. When he fell, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. 
By the mer- multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled uh, the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering chair, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. By reason of thy brightness, I will lay thee to the ground. I will cast thee to the ground and lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and, uh, and never shalt thou be any more. God did not create Satan as a fallen being. He was created perfect until he chose to lift up his heart in pride. He, God created him perfect, and then he had a will, and he chose to lift up his heart in pride because of his wisdom and of his beauty and because he wanted to be like the Most High. Now, there are some people out there, uh, those who teach uh, universal salvation, believe that God created Satan as Satan. And they have to say that for various reasons. I'm not going to get into all that right now, but that's a big load of garbage. God didn't create Satan as Satan. This, this passage makes it clear. He created him. Everything God creates is perfect. Satan became Satan through his fall. But he was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. When he fell, he didn't lose his wisdom. What did he do? The passage says he corrupted it. When he was in Eden, the garden of God, that's not the same thing as saying there was a garden eastward in Eden. I'll come back to that in a moment. When he was covered with precious stones, that showed his his, you know, as the anointed cherub, he's above the throne of God, covering the throne of God. And there's some priestly work here, just like when God had the high priest in Israel, he wore a breastplate with precious stones in it, you know. He's a musical being. He has music built into him. He's a worship leader, right? He's the anointed, meaning he was a Christ, but he became a fallen creature. And now he's a false Christ, which is why the Lord said, I'll set my king upon my holy hill. And the Bible refers to the Lord's Christ, the true Christ, in contrast with the false. But as the anointed cherub, he had the highest position in the angelic realm. There's four cherub around the throne of God. Satan was the fifth. There's that number five again. And if you look at the cherub representing the different creatures on the earth, nothing said of the reptiles. Isn't it interesting he's a serpent? And why is he more subtle than any beast of the field? Because the face of a cherub is an ox. You study that in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. Check it out. You'll see it. And so he is, and by the way, how many times does the ox head come up in idolatry? (laughs) Quite a bit, if you understand anything about idolatry down through world history. He was upon the holy mountain of God. Now, you got to understand, Hebrews 12, 22 talks about, you're coming to Mount Zion under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now, give me five minutes, and let me tie all this together, please, okay? I might go more than five, but the choir will just have to wait to get ready to come in. I'm just kidding. We don't have one. <laughs> so, don't let me lose you because it's the end of the lesson because I'm trying to bring all this together and what we're talking about. There is a mountain of God in heaven That is the holy city, the new Jerusalem, okay? He was on that holy mountain of God. It it talks about the stones of fire. In the foundation of that city are all those precious stones. It's lit up with the brightness of God. It's stones of fire. And he was going up and down with merchandise and traffic. He wasn't selling jewelry, man. He was selling ideas. The, The marketplace of ideas, what is he doing? He's trying to convince angels he has more wisdom than God Almighty. And he convinced them to follow him in his plan. He must be pretty crafty to get a third of the angels to take him up on it. He said, I will five times in response. God said, God said in Ezekiel 28, when you compare Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, God said, I will five times in response to Lucifer's I wills. I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee. I'll cast thee to the ground. I'll lay thee before kings. They may behold thee. I'll bring thee to ashes upon earth in sight of all them that behold thee. And you read about that in Revelation 20. Lucifer said, I will. God said, well, I will. And God's I wills went out. That is the essence of sin. I will. Right? When, when Lucifer, God, God's will is the, the issue. 
But Lucifer said, I will in, in rebellion against God's will. But the true Christ humbled himself and said, not my will, but thine be done. What a contrast. Now, let me try to bring this together. Just listen carefully. We, we've talked about this already. and We'll see this more. There's a governmental structure in the heavens like what we have on earth. It's just as real, although invisible to us. That there are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in the heavenly places just like there are on earth. Satan brought rebellion against God first in heaven and then moved that rebellion to the earth. When God created Adam in response to Lucifer's rebellion, that infuriated Satan, which is why he shows up immediately to bring about the fall. Why? He wants to usurp that dominion that he once had. And now Satan can tell Christ in the temptation in the wilderness, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world, which means he has them. When Adam fell, when Adam fell, Satan usurped that dominion. All right? Now, the earth, by the way, is in the heaven, is it not? <laughs> yes. It's the command center from where God is going to rule. Is God going to rule the universe from the earth in the future? Well, his city's coming down. His city's in the third heaven. It's coming down to the earth in the future. You know what that tells me? It tells me that's where it was in the past. Why do I believe that? Well, when God created Adam, he, he put him eastward. In a, he planted this garden eastward in Eden. Now, when you study this, and you look at the Euphrates River, and you look at the Fertile Crescent, and you look at where civilization began, when you really study this, when you compare it, there was a garden eastward in that area, and that's where Satan shows up to bring about the fall, but God chose a man named Abram and made him a promise concerning a land, and when you trace the land grant, it's in a pyramid shape in the, in the center of the earth in that same area. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Did God give Abraham a land? Why is he looking for a city? What is the city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God? It's New Jerusalem. That means on that land, that's where the city's coming. And that's where it must have been. Okay? Because the thing which has been is that which shall be. So the land grant that God promised Abraham is in the center of the earth. Again, it's the area where the Holy Jerusalem that is now in the third heaven. Look, this stuff about Jesus when he went to heaven, he started a building project to build us a mansion. He didn't say in my father's house will be many mansions when I go build them. He said in my father's house are many mansions. And look, the, the, the holy city of God is, is not, it is not being, being built <laughs> over time during the church age. It was already there. Why, why, why is it... Why did God create three heavens and move his city to the third? It has to do with this rebellion and God abdicating and removing his throne with the purpose of eventually bringing it back to the earth. That city, we're about to study it in our study in Revelation, but the city is 1,500 miles square. Now, that includes its height. Wouldn't you say a city that's 1,500 miles high is like a mountain, to say the least? The holy mountain of God in Ezekiel 28, the mountain of the congregation in Isaiah 14, he's talking about that holy city. There is a Mount Zion and a, and a new Jerusalem located in the third heaven. In Revelation 14, for an example, the 144,000 are on Mount Zion in heaven with the Lamb. They're in heaven. It's called Mount Zion. There's a Mount Zion and a Jerusalem in heaven. And it, it's been here before and it's coming back in the future. The garden of God... Eden, the garden of God, the garden of God is the same idea as paradise. When Paul was caught up to the third heaven, where did he go? Where did he go when he said he was caught up to the third heaven? Paradise, 2 Corinthians 12. Where is that paradise? You study it in Revelation 21 and 22. It's the city of God. Now, there was a race of beings on this earth before Adam called the sons of God. We'll have to look at that later, but mark it down. Job 38, 7. They were rejoicing and singing when God laid the foundations of the earth, which means they predate the six days, obviously. And uh, whenever Lucifer fell, 
He did not lose his great wisdom, he corrupted it. And in his great wisdom, he devised a plan by which he was able to convince these angels to follow him in his rebellion against God. He basically promised them they could be their own gods. Isn't that what the temptation was with the woman? You shall be as gods. And that they'd be better off following him. The passage in Ezekiel 28 refers to his merchandise. It refers to the iniquity of his traffic. He was targeting the upper echelon, which evidently he was successful because in Daniel 10, you read about the, king, uh, the uh, prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia, and these are spiritual beings. And Michael the archangel has to... You, you, Michael the archangel is the only archangel mentioned as a holy angel of God. There are other high up angels that followed Lucifer, evidently. Now let me, don't miss, we're almost done, just, just listen. Don't, don't, don't miss this point. When, whenever that rebellion was going on, and by the way, I'll stop when I'm ready to stop. Forget the clock. Whenever, whenever that rebellion was going on, God put a stop to it. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, Depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. When did God prepare the everlasting fire for the devil and his angels? When did God create the lake of fire? Okay? Uh, he did not create it in the six days. <laughs> he didn't create it after the six days because there's nothing created after the six days until God creates a new heaven and a new earth. When did he create the lake of fire? So you got a massive problem right there if you reject the gap because it fits perfectly with that rebellion and he put a stop to it when he created the lake of fire and said, this is where you're going if you follow him. That'll put a stop to it. <laughs> the creation of the lake of fire is a major problem for those who reject the Genesis gap. So God withdrew his throne and his city up far above the earth and destroyed it with a great flood. Genesis 1-2. We'll read more about it in 2 Peter 3. He then reconstructed it and created man in his own image and gave him dominion over it, which infuriated Satan, obviously. And this earth became, the, listen, this earth became the place of testing where the conflict of the ages plays out. Through the fall of man, Satan usurped his dominion on the earth. You've got to understand what Satan is trying to do. His focus from the beginning of mankind has been to oppose God's purpose for the earth because that was the focus of God's revelation. The earth, the earth, the earth. The only time you find out about his plan for the heavens is when you come to Paul's ministry. It's revealed through him. So God kept a secret within himself concerning his plan to reconcile the heavens and the body of Christ was his secret purpose from before the world began. And if he purposed us to reconcile the government, we talked about this last time, we'll elaborate on it more, I'm trying to end now. But if we're going to be reconciling the governments in the heavenly places and he kept it a secret, he kept it a secret because of the adversary. And if he made this purpose, it had to be in response to a rebellion that took place before the world began, the world of mankind. The hidden wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, had Satan known it, he certainly wouldn't have crucified the Lord. Glory, Paul said. So in the end, there's going to be a final battle with Satan. He's going to be cast in the lake of fire. God's going to renovate the heavens and earth by fire. He's going to create a new heaven, a new earth, and then his city will once again come back down to the earth where it was before. God could have destroyed Satan and his angels, but he allows them to work. And uh, one thing that gives man a choice, right? There is a great contest that rages that will ultimately prove when it's all said and done, God is all wise and the most high God and Satan is no match for his power and wisdom. But God did not cause the fall of Lucifer. God did not cause the fall of Adam, but he has used it and he has a purpose and a plan. And to me, when you really understand the details, we just were brief and hitting the highlights. When you understand the details of things we talked about this morning, all this fits perfectly with this idea of the Genesis gap. I'll end this morning with a quote from a writer from years ago. He said, I won't give you his name because the name doesn't matter. I just like what he said here. The moment we perceive that Satan and his host are involved in Earth's destinies, that moment we realize the transcendent scope of divine revelation. It lifts itself above and beyond our puny horizon and little selfishness 
and we are found to be tiny and insignificant spectators and participators in a conflict waged between heaven and the unseen world. The combatants being for the most part invisible to our eyes and beyond our kin. You think it's all about man. It's much bigger than that. And the Genesis gap fits that perfectly. All right? We, we said some things this morning that we didn't elaborate on, but Lord willing, we will in future studies. Let's stop there. Father, thank you for the time we had in your word this morning. Help us to understand these things and pray you bless the service to follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.